Um, so I would like to introduce, we have two presenters tonight, Walter Grayson and Connie Goddard. Um, so some of you um, may know Walter, he's done programs for us in the past. And he is actually among the most prominent historians, educators, and urbanists in the United States, and actually has lectured around the world in places like the United Kingdom, um, where is it, Canada, New Zealand, has trained corporate government, entertainment, media, law enforcement, military, and medical industry professionals. So I am constantly in awe of um, what Dr. Grayson brings to any room that he's in. He's the author of six books and many articles. If I read everything, um, we won't have the time to hear his presentation. But since we're talking about education, I've also found that um, anything you want to know about uh, policy, laws, statutes in New Jersey, he can pull out of thin air with uh, names, dates, and places right away. So please feel free to ask um, any of your questions. Walter was also named one of today's Black History Makers by the Philadelphia Daily News. Uh, Connie Goddard comes to us also locally. Uh, she lives in Titton Falls. And this program that she's doing tonight is actually based on research she's been conducting for a book that she's writing about manual training and industrial education programs. And she'll tell us more about what that means and why it's relevant to the conversation about race. One of her focuses has been on the school in Bordentown, New Jersey, which uh, closed in 1955, the Manual Training and Industrial School for Colored Youth. She's gonna tell us about that and also how uh, Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, and our own T. Thomas Fortune got involved in this conversation. Connie actually was raised in Chicago with roots in the Dakotas. She is uh, also a widely published scholar and journalist. So part of um, her uh, experience tonight will also be reaching out to people in the audience, to you, for any kind of um, input, stories, questions that uh, might help her in this book. And she'll tell you more about it. Um, Walter is going to go first and then Connie. So um, uh, welcome. Thank you so much, Patty. That was very kind. And you know, you can just say I, I'm a little kid who grew up around Red Bank, attended Calvary Baptist Church. You can you can leave it leave it there. Um, it's lovely to always be back and connect with folks in Red Bank, and especially since the the Fortune Center is opened, it is just extraordinary to see everyone who has supported the mission. Um, for now, goodness, it's it's getting dangerously close to ten years. So. Um, what I'm doing here tonight in trying to introduce Connie's work and, and open the door for folks to look back at this, this tradition of manual industrial training, that's a subtopic for something I've started on for a very long time is uh, the historical oversight about the systems of segregation, it's particularly in the United States, but even around the world, that as I was a graduate student, almost all of the histories that were widely circulating um, were pretty much focused on either World War II and the Civil War with a small kind of subcategory of the American Revolution. And then within the fields that I was most curious about of social and cultural history, particularly of uh, African Americans, there were only two really dominant topics. There was a topic on slavery and enslavement and the debates around the way plantations functioned and how they evolved. And then there was a later, more, more emerging scholarship around the civil rights movement, um, the, the Montgomery bus boycott moving forward through Dr. King's assassination. And so there's this just vast terrain that I knew there were documents, I knew there was evidence, but no one had really pulled it together in an organized way to grapple with segregation. I think um, C. Van Woodward's book was still considered the standard for dealing with um, segregation in the North. And so it, I think it was 50 years after its publication. So I, I really committed myself 
to taking on the questions of how segregation evolved in the United States, not just the black codes or the Jim Crow laws that emerged after the Civil War, but really three, three and a half centuries of attempts by states and municipalities to control black population. One of the threads within that is about education. The difficulty of educational institutions serving African-Americans and how they evolved over, the, over those vast stretches of time. Within this modern period that I've, I've called in a book, Industrial Segregation, the story of what happens with manual and industrial training is, is grossly misunderstood and misrepresented, um, mostly in some of the forces that, that you're going to hear about tonight in this debate, oversimplified debate between Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. And so as we approach the topic, what was astonishing for me was to look at these forces in New Jersey and to really understand that in a context that I came from, I understood segregation as predicated on violence. And as it evolved through the 20th century, it became about erasure, the, the removal and total destruction of African-American communities after 1970. That was the heart of a lot of the work I did from about 1997 through 2012 or 2013. At the heart of that conversation in New Jersey, there stands the Bordentown Manual and Industrial Training School. This place that was extraordinarily important called the Tuskegee of the North for bringing African-Americans into an, an early kind of professional class that those African-American families were able to achieve a kind of economic stability even within Jim Crow segregation that enabled them to build civil rights organizations like the National Urban League, like the NAACP, that enabled them to build structures of economic empowerment in, in the framework that Marcus Garvey offered under the Universal Negro Impro Improvement Association. These voices made it possible to build the civil rights struggle in the North that was the inspiration for Dr. King's work in Alabama and Georgia. And we never tell this story. It's only been maybe 15 years of really excavating the story of civil rights struggle outside of the South. In fact, it's still considered a cutting edge topic for new dissertations and new graduate student research. For me personally, this, this evolution in understanding the way segregation in New Jersey has evolved um, always had to account for Bordentown and the idea that industrial education had to be balanced with academic knowledge. It wasn't, do we learn to become better farmers and better bricklayers and better industrial workers versus do we go on for higher education? Do we attempt to kind of gain a command of the liberal arts and graduate degrees? Both of those things worked hand in hand. And if you look at the primary source literature of the late 19th and early 20th century, you see those debates unfolding and you see people formulating on their own how to make the two parts work together. I, of course, am a product of this balance that Bordentown represents, that despite the fact that it stopped operation in 1955, one of the founding institutions of my life was the Court Street School in, Edu in Freehold, New Jersey. This institution was deeply re related to the Bordentown, Bordentown Institute. And there are many of the students who finished eighth grade at Court Street and went then on to Bordentown to gain their technical degrees. Those are the folks who advanced the civil rights movement in the region. They are my grandparents. They are my parents. They are my aunts and uncles and cousins. They went on to work at Fort Monmouth in the Signal Corps lab. They went on to work in Bell Labs and build the satellites communications networks that surround the world. I've had the great pleasure in the last three years to excavate the history of Walter McAfee, an absolutely polymath mathematical genius who established that we could bounce radio signals off of the moon. That was the premise of how we were able to create future satellite connections and win the Cold War. This process of black genius, this process of building institutions that created freedom and equality for all people was symbolized by what, what the technicians and scientists like McAfee called the black brain belt. The black brain belt is a phrase that I came across in a book by Lenora Walker McKay called The Blacks of Monmouth County. 
in that text, she makes reference to the technicians and engineers and scientists who worked at Fort Monmouth and who worked at Bell Labs, and that there were over a thousand of them living along the shore communities of Monmouth County. They called this area the Black Brain Belt because of their scientific and technical expertise. In my mind, because I was a child growing up in those communities, I never realized it, but it was what made me gravitate to the idea of Wakanda and the Black Panther, a fictional Black country with huge technological advancements that made them one of the most powerful countries in the world. For all intents and purposes, I was already learning how to program computers at age nine and 10. That was only because I had these engineers and technicians to teach me during their free time. I lived in Wakanda. It was not a fictional place. It was Belmar and Asbury Park and Neptune and Long Branch and Middletown and Atlantic Highlands and Red Bank. All of it a product of what T. Thomas Fortune dreamed of when he moved to Red Bank in 1901. Today, I'm proud to carry this work forward in doing events like this to dream of the day where we can restore sustainable black and indigenous communities around the world when the conditions of erasure and displacement that I've documented are no longer the norm. In the last month, I'm very blessed that Representative Sheila Jackson Lee and the Historic Black Towns and Settlements Alliance have proposed a national legislative initiative to form a national black and indigenous historic trail across the United States that would go about restoring these communities and make them the promised land that Dr. King dreamed of, that we've fought for, that we have struggled and nearly lost over the last 50 years. And so tonight is a hugely important conversation. I'm proud to be here with Professor Goddard. And I see we also have another expert is Zoe Buckholder is in the room. Um, it's going to be an exceptional conversation and I'm looking forward to sharing it with all of you. Thank you for the time and chance to participate. Okay, Patty, do you expect me to come on now or? Um, Connie, Connie well, you're on. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> All right. I unmuted myself. Okay. Uh, so um, anyway, uh, I want to thank Walter for his um, very interesting introduction to this and um, I'm uh, sitting here digesting it and thinking, okay, um, how do I fit um, my sort of my little story into this uh, great picture that he's talking about? Um, uh, also um, sort of midway, uh, well, let's see, I'm gonna start more at the beginning. I want to say thank um, Alice Kelterborn, who is one of the teachers in the vocational training program at, um, at Brookdale College because I think she will have some interesting follow-ups uh, to do. And also I'm delighted to hear that Zoe Burkholder is here. She teaches at Monmouth and she has written some very good histories of uh, the Bordentown School as well. So, uh, and um, I'm looking forward to, uh, I kept trying to cut time out of my talk so that we would have a lot of room for uh, time for discussion this evening. So, um, First of all, um, uh, thanks, I guess, have I said thanks to Linda and Patty for making this possible. And um, next I want to, before I, I made some slides up, but before I get into them, I want to say a few things, a few uh, pieces of background. Um, one is uh, sort of the question of what does manual training mean? What is industrial education? And uh, specifically, uh, uh, does it have different meanings in black communities than it does in a white community? Is it inherently racist or paternalistic? Um, and to me, um, uh, my interest in this it, it was, is sort of um, uh, is positive because uh, my, um, my mother attended something called the State Normal and Industrial School in a little town of Ellendale, North Dakota. And I must note that my brother, I see, has chimed in from Kalamazoo, Michigan. So I'll say hello to him. He can correct me if I talk about any family history that's not right. But at any rate, mother and other relatives who attended this school were very fond of it and learned a great deal about it. Um, I also have a friend in, um, uh, uh, who lives uh, near here who went to high school as I did in the 50s, and, but she was in Tulsa. 
Oklahoma. And for her, she attended the school for white students or the high school. Uh, Tulsa also had a manual training school and that was where the black children went to school. So uh, there was something that I had not been aware of until I started researching this like 10 or 15 years ago, probably a little more than that, uh, a definite divide. There were two kind of separate ideas um, uh, about what manual training is. Um, so I began to understand that um, manual training had a rather bad rap in the black community and I spent some time trying to figure out why. So um, I made some slides and I am going to, uh, I hope, um, get them up here. Um, boom. <clears throat> and come on, let's go. Ah, all right, here we go. <clears throat> I haven't quite, we haven't quite mastered this technology, but we're getting there. Okay, so I'm going to start from the beginning. Oh, and before I go, oops, Daisy, what happened to that? I hit the wrong button. Sorry, folks. All right, here we are. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, about halfway through, my friend Lorraine Stone, who uh, a lot of local people know for her um, uh, impersonal. Her acting, her acting of various uh, various people, um, is she's going to read a really interesting poem uh, that uh, that relates to this subject. So we're talking about the oh, Borden Valley School. Connie, and what? Can Connie, you this is Patty. Yeah, uh, we cannot see your. All we see on the screen is the list of the files. Have you opened oh. up? Well, I have. Okay, us? you do, still don't have it. Nope. Yeah, you have to you have to stop your screen share and then do another one with your with your PowerPoint open. Okay. All right. Sorry about that, folks. Thank you for um, when I practiced this. It um, I didn't have that problem. Okay. Now the PowerPoint is open. All right. What do you see now? It's good. That's the it. Gordon Town School. Okay. What you can tell us about racial disparities in education. All right. Okay. All right. Fine. Thank you. Okay. Um, I uh, wanted this talk to focus on a bunch of questions which I put up here, uh, uh, but I think I'm going to focus more on content um, uh, because we're, uh, I, wanna, I want to get to the question um, period quickly. The Bordentown School, uh, one of the things it had a lot of names, it was to some called the School of Tomorrow, it was also known as uh, Tuskegee of the North. Uh, and in our discussion, we'll talk about what manual training meant in black communities and what it meant in white communities. One of the really uh, great um, uh, comments that I got from a conversation with Walter uh, a week or so ago when we were talking about this is, uh, Walter, I hope you remember this line, um, how the whole idea of making oneself useful, which was one of the ideas behind manual training schools, but that idea was decimated by prejudice. And I think that's something that we really need to all remember. So um, quickly, the um, Bordentown School was a product of the progressive era, which ran from the late 1880s through 1920 or so. Uh, American society was under a great deal of change from a rural to an urban society, immigration, industrialization. It was also uh, an age of social reform, uh, settlement houses, and an attempt to cur curtail corporate power. Many iconic schools were established during this era, um, uh, the best known of which is probably the laboratory school in Chicago that we associate with um, John Dewey. Um, also kindergartens were uh, established. They were similar in that they were um, activity, uh, activity as well as um, um, liter um, <clears throat> making play an educational experience. Um, the new education uh, was a term that was used. It was how schools uh, learning could be more relevant to everyday lives. One of the things that Dewey talked about was what are the what can we learn from uh, the occupations of people in our community, like learning math through carpentry or chemistry or um, uh, cooking. So the <clears throat> now 
This was an also an era of vast expanse of public schooling, but of course this was severely limited for black children, uh, uh, particularly in the South. The manual training movement itself started in the uh, 1880s. Uh, the idea was that students would spend half of their day doing academic work and half um, learning how to use tools, um, uh, both to make things and also just skills such as accuracy and precision and persistence, etc. The idea was strong that book learning was not sufficient. Too many kids were dropping out of school at too early an age. Um, <clears throat> I think it's important to think of how many people were in school at the time. Uh, around 1900, 10 to 20% of white children were in high school. Fewer than 2% were in college. Of course, um, it was far less for black students. There were many parts of the South where there was no such thing, counties where there was no such thing as a high school for black students or even much of an elementary school. So um, the Bordentown School itself was established in 1886. Um, uh, and it was founded by a group of pastors led by Walter, the Reverend Walter Allen Rice, who was a really uh, very interesting uh, character. He'd been born a slave in South Carolina. He served in the Union Army. He taught for a while in a freedman school. He um, uh, came north, he became a pastor, and he eventually located in central New Jersey. He and um, a group of other men uh, were aware of the ferment in manual training and they established a couple of organizations uh, to start a school. The idea behind the school is that um, the students would get training in particular and useful industries uh, falling to their race. Uh, the idea was that um, <clears throat> they would learn uh, dressmaking and cooking and carpentry and some horticulture, plus get what he called a good English education. Uh, there were, of course, high standards of citizenship and character were emphasized. Um, <clears throat> the school uh, grew slowly, private donations, many from uh, local churches, um, uh, and had about 50 students. Um, and by 1894, the school acquired, got the attention of the state of New Jersey, which um, acquired its assets and renamed it the Manual Training and Industrial School for Colored Youth. One of the interesting stories um, about the school is that it was, it was often called Ironsides. And the reason is because the land which the state acquired for it um, was, uh, had originally been an estate owned by uh, Commodore Charles Stewart, who was famously the commander of the USS Constitution in the War of 1812, known as Ironside. So that's another um, uh, interesting bit of the school's history. But then in 1897, uh, um, the Rices went off to uh, start another school and a new principal was named, he was a James Monroe Gregory. He was a, uh, a, a noted professor at Howard. He was a scholar. Um, he was known as a scholar there. He was one of the first students to be recruited by Howard and had a distinguished career there. He worked with Frederick Douglass and wrote a biography of him. He was very active in education circles in Washington. He was the founding president of something called the Association for the Teachers of Colored Children, and he was recruited to head the school in 1897. Now, the school was supported by the state. It was tuition free, but part of part, to pay for in return for the free tuition, students labored, um, contributed their labor. Now, that might sound like a horrible um, thing, but this was a rather common practice. Um, uh, it had been uh, true in, in helping young men attain a higher education for 100, 150 years, there was something actually started by a bunch of abolitionists called the Society for Promoting Manual Labor in Literary Institutions. So this idea that uh, the students would spend half of the day in academic classes, half of the day in, um, in learning trades, uh, and one of those uh, afternoons they would spend in the school's fields, in its orchards, um, doing meal service, doing laundry, etc. Um, 
By 1900 or so, the school had around 100 students. They were in grades six through 10. They were a wide variety of ages, though, not just uh, 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 somewhere up to almost 20 years old. Now, um, <clears throat> uh, at this point, I want to bring in um, Red Bank's famed um, writer and publisher, T. Thomas Fortune, who um, was uh, one of the, um, he was an agitator, he was a brilliant writer, he uh, was uh, sort of a speak truth to power kind of guy. Um, and in 1898, he wrote an interesting article called, um, What Kind of Education Does the Afro-American Most Need? And in the point that he made in this article is that at the time, um, what was most needed wa were, um, uh, were people with skills. People knew not knew how to do things. People knew not knew how to build things. People knew know how to maintain things. Um, and he felt that there had been an overemphasis on higher education. I want to make a slight diversion here. One of the things that I found fascinating in doing work on this is that um, prior to the Civil War, most of the skilled labor in the South had been done by enslaved people. Um, after the Civil War, as free men, it was much harder for them to get work doing that. And of course, we know what happened with sharecropping and a lot of other um, practices that, um, uh, that uh, did not take advantage of their skills. So there was one point of view, should um, our schools, should schools for Black children focus on practic practical skills and economic self-sufficiency, or should they be more academic and focus on uh, political rights and self-determination. Um, now, uh, uh, Fortin, who was at the time the publisher and uh, editor of something called The New York Age, um, in September of 1905, there was a lengthy, uh, quite laudable article about the school that appeared in Fortune's paper. Now, whether or not he wrote it, um, I don't know, except that it, um, it sounds very much like um, it sounds very much like fortune. So um, he said of the school, and now at this time it was a roughly a hundred or so students. It was run by the Gregories, uh, um, and had um, had acquired uh, some workshops as well as the agricultural lands around it, but. Uh, Fortune said that the school put equal stress on literary and industrial branches, um, uh, which was a term used for subjects at the time. And um, he said uh, that without literary training, um, the students would be poorly trained um, uh, for any kind of work. Uh, the faculty was, uh, and one thing the school has always had an all black faculty, all black administration. Um, and this was something true from its start, but the faculty were role models of good citizenship, good character, et cetera. The students acquired practical experience in carpentry and doing repair work of buildings. They handled um, a lot of the meal service. They picked apples in the orchards and they worked in the fields and handled the livestock that the school acquired. So, <clears throat> Um, now, one of the things that I found really interesting while working on this is, um, well, reading a lot of the um, books, particularly uh, you know, industrial education and manual training for white students and for black students. And there seems to be this sort of idea that an industrial education meant preparing students for sort of menial or low level jobs in industries. Um, and I began to realize when I was reading, I thought, my goodness, these, um, uh, there doesn't seem to be a good definition of what an industrial education actually is. So here is, um, uh, this is a picture of uh, the Ironsides Echo, the student publications at the school were used the term Ironsides. Um, this was published in 1908. And um, it included a survey of graduates uh, in between 1908 and 1898, I'm sorry, and 1905. Um, these were the years that Gregory was in charge. And uh, 
They found about 60 odd uh, graduates and 25 responded to this survey. Among them, there were nine teachers and uh, school principals. There were four who were retail clerks and managers of um, uh, small establishments. Six um, women had become nurses. One man joined the Navy. There was a journalist, a carpenter, and a caterer. Three had gone on to get college degrees. Um, one became a pharmacist and another part, a park designer. So um, the, those, are, um, those are substantial, as Walter pointed out in his remarks, those are rather substantial, that's a rather substantial kinds of jobs. So um, <clears throat> at this time, we're talking 1905 to 1920 or so, uh, but a conflict between Booker T. Washington and W.B. Du Bois, uh, um, uh, got a lot of attention. And uh, one of the things, even though they are looked at as being diametrically opposed, actually the two men had a great deal in common as far as what their priorities were. Um, uh, and they had, they maintained a personal friendship for, um, for the beginnings of their professional life. One of the things, Booker T. Washington had been born a slave. He had walked to Hampton Institute as a teenager and um, uh, managed to become a student there. He then uh, uh, had an opportunity to open a similar school in uh, Alabama called Tuskegee and uh, began um, uh, and became a leading spokesman in this country. Uh, and Du Bois had a rather different uh, experience. He grew up in, uh, in Western Massachusetts. He was orphaned at an early age. Uh, some people uh, in the town made sure that he got a college education. He went to Fisk and then he went on to Harvard. He studied in Germany, he got a PhD. He was an absolutely brilliant man. However, given the circumstances of the day, he could not get a, a, a much of a respectable academic job at any American university. So um, uh, one of the historians of Negro thought at this time pose these guys as Bookerites and anti-Bookerites. Now, I'm going to take a little break and um, uh, my friend Lorraine Stone is going to read um, a poem about um, the difference between uh, Booker T and, um, uh, and W.B. Du Bois. And then I'm going to very quickly um, cover the, uh, actually the heyday of the school. I wanted to focus on the beginning of it because we're looking at these, these issues about industrial education. So I'm gonna stop the share and let Lorraine have my chair and um, she's gonna to read to you, okay? Good evening. This poem is by Dudley Randall. It was written in 1914, so you can see um, around the time that, that Connie has been talking about. Uh, it points up the differences in the approach of Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois with, with a little humor. Um, so, Booker T. and W.E.B. It <clears throat> seems to me, said Booker T, it takes a mighty lot of cheek to study chemistry in Greek when Mr. Charlie needs a hand to hold a cotton on his land. And when Miss Ann looks for a cook, why stick your nose in a book? I don't agree, said W.E.B. If I should have the drive to seek knowledge of chemistry or Greek, I'll do it. Charles and Miss can look another place for hand or cook. Some men rejoice in skill of hand and some in cultivating land. But there are others who maintain the right to cultivate the brain. It <clears throat> seems to me, said Booker T, that all you folks have missed the boat, who shout about the right to vote and spend vain days and sleepless nights in uproar over civil rights. Just keep your mouth shut, do not grouse. 
but work and save and buy a house. I don't agree, said W.E.B. For what can property avail if dignity and justice fail? Unless you help to make the laws, they'll take your house with trumped up costs. I hope you know that a rope is as tight, a fire is as hot, no matter how much cash you've got. Speak soft and try your little plan. But as for me, I'll be a man. <clears throat> Seems to me, said Booker T, I don't agree, said W.E.B. One of my um, friends in Chicago who uh, teaches at a university there uh, and wrote a really interesting dissertation about uh, Slater, um, about a teacher in the South during the Civil War or in, during Reconstruction era, also uses that poem in her class. Um, it, it, there's, as I listen to it, there are lots of things that we could, um, that we could discuss about it. And I, um, I think one of you, Linda, did you put it or Kerwin, did you put it in the chat? So you can, um, if anyone wants to read it, uh, yeah. it's, um, it is, is it up there, Kerwin? Yes. Okay, all right, good. Now okay. I'm gonna go back to my, and I hope I go back to my, aha. Uh, uh -huh. Now, are you seeing my slides or are you seeing my, what are you seeing guys? We see, we see your slides. Okay, all right, terrific. Thank you very much. I'm gonna, now I'm going to whip through, um, uh, whip through this, um, using the slideshow, here we go, slideshow. Oh, come on. All right, come on, I can't get to the, the, there we go. Uh, the, hmm. Oh, okay, from current slide. I didn't hit the right button. Sorry, folks. It's not uh -huh. easy, Connie, virtually. No, well, what's happening is I keep getting that little thing that says you are screen sharing comes down and it interferes with my, okay, now we're back in the score. Okay, um, this is, um, if we're, this, we're teaching a class, I'd spend a lot, a lot of time on this, but I um, am, uh, I want to move rather quickly through the next 30 or 40 years of the Bordentown School. Um, there were some interesting, this, we were talking about racial, um, racial disparities and sets of conflicts that were prevailing like 1910 to 1920. And the whole idea of manual training or vocational education was a contentious um, uh, subject in schools that serve mainly white students. The idea was, should U US schools um, follow the U European system, which sort of divided students at age 14 into either um, labor or manual labor or higher education. Uh, one of the questions was what best promoted democracy. Some said that it was um, not uh, socially efficient to uh, provide students with an education that um, they were not going to need. However, there were also lots of post-secondary programs. New Jersey was actually kind of a leader in this in all kinds of trade subjects. Um, now for black students, there, this, there, the, uh, there were similarities and differences. I think many of you have maybe heard New, New Jersey was regarded as a Mississippi of the North. Jim Crow was here. Um, uh, though not as strong as it was in the South. During the Great Migration, uh, there was some interesting developments in education, um, whereas uh, um, in the Northern parts of the state, there had been limited school segregation, but as soon as uh, there were a lot more um, black people coming from the South, there was a lot more prejudice. And of course, um, who got the worst schools? Um, uh, there was a feeling among many black parents that uh, segregated schools provided more nurture and less hostility. Um, there was a notion of what was a Negro job and uh, uh, the feeling that schools should be preparing students for those. 
um, that was um, not a uh, that was not popular with um, Mr. Gregory, who was principal of the school in Bordentown. And when he was under pressure to make the school more of a, a job training institution, he um, he said, "I've had enough of this. I am not running a." Um, not running a job training institution, and he resigned. Um, the school brought in um, a new man to run it. He was William Valentine, and he too was a rather uh, extraordinary leader for the school. Um, <clears throat> he had uh, grown up in Montclair uh, and then gone to Harvard, graduated in 1905, 1904. He had apparently spent some time teaching in the South. He also ran uh, uh, some schools in Indianapolis that um, followed really rather closely a lot of Dewey's ideas about um, using occupations as the basis for uh, as the basis for a curriculum. He said that he began to see the school as a social settlement. Um, that the school that he ran there among historians, there are lots of different points of view about it, but um, uh, it, the thing that is important here is Valentine School was um, profiled in a book that John Dewey and his daughter wrote in 1915 called Schools of Tomorrow. So the question was, question I'm raising is to what extent was the Bordentown School a school of tomorrow. During the 1920s, the school grew substantially, um, 300, 300 or more students. There were um, intramural activities and there were enrichment. There were bands and glee clubs that toured the state. Um, it was a self-contained community, all black faculty, well-educated. They um, came from some of the leading institutions, both um, uh, black colleges as well as um, uh, places like Wellesley and Dartmouth. Um, and uh, the, uh, in 1928, the school got a, um, got developed a full, um, developed a full secondary program. Um, <clears throat> at any rate, Linda, are you going to tell me, or Patty, are you going to tell me that I need to get, um, that my time is about running out? Um, it yes. is a couple more minutes. Okay. Well, I and want to go to quickly. To okay. Okay. I want to. Um, I want to show this picture. This was. Um, uh, this is a delightful painting of the school, sort of in its heyday, um, and you can see the state of New Jersey. Um, uh, really uh, did a rather nice job in supporting the school. Of course. Valentine was given credit for being very politically astute and getting what he needed from the um, from the state um, uh, legislature. But you can see this: uh, the campus was on a bluff um, above the uh, Delaware. Um, the administration building, which had most of the classrooms, is in the back of this picture, an oval parade ground. One of the things that was a feature of the school was the boys all participated in a militia. Um, in the front of the picture, you can see orchards, you can see fields. Um, down right uh, at the front uh, were faculty housing. There was more faculty housing in the back. Um, uh, some of the barns for livestock were um, over at the left of the picture. Um, workshops and um, uh, and assembly halls, etc., were uh, at the right-hand side of the picture. This was all um, about uh, a half mile south of Bordentown. Uh, much of the campus is still there. Route 295 runs uh, right through the tennis courts right now. Anyway, this is a rather idealized picture of the campus, but you can see that it was quite a substantial institution. Um, <clears throat> Valentine wrote at one time in 1926 about the aim of the curriculum to train boys and girls morally, industrially, and mentally for good citizenship, for useful work, and for earning a living by skilled work. Uh, and uh, when I read that useful service comment, I think of Walter's remark about making yourself useful and how it was decimated by, uh, by racism. Um, however, the, it seems that the Valentine, that the Bordentown School um, gave uh, its students a sufficient education and the ability to earn a living and uh, a, a sort of a good set of armor 
uh, uh, against uh, the um, against a, an unfriendly world. So in the 1930s, the school was the school's heyday. Enrollment grew to over 400 students. There were over 60 faculty members. Many of them stayed there for 30 or 40 years. An impressive list of visitors, the educator Mary McLeod Bethune, Duke Ellington spent time there. So did Paul Robeson, Eleanor Roosevelt visited. I also read in something this afternoon that James Weldon Johnson um, uh, was there as well um, and others. It was a center for black cultural life in the state. Many organizations not welcome elsewhere stayed there. The athletic facilities, it became known as the Black Forest Hills. It was really a substantial institution. Um, now, uh, uh, I'm going to talk very quickly about the end of the school and Zoe uh, Burkholder, if I hope she's still here, has written a great deal about this and I, um, I think she can edify us all on how and why the school, um, the school closed. Um, in the 1940s, uh, the school was at least sort of considered elite in many ways, but it's all continued to welcome students from troubled backgrounds. Um, after the Second World War, the state was gradually desegregating um, and Ballantyne and the schools came under attack as anachronistic. Um, he, Ballantyne retired in 1950. Um, there were a couple of other principals that um, uh, came in after the um, Brown versus Board of Education. The school lost um, some of its support in the legislature and it was, uh, some say, rather peremptorily closed in June of 1955. Uh, there were some very, very, very modest efforts at integrating it. Um, uh, Governor Maynard, who uh, said and I, um, uh, that the school did not offer much of an education, and that comment sort of grates on me because um, it did seem to me that it offered quite a substantial education. Okay, last slide. Um, I mentioned the, um, if you, people who want to learn more about the school, uh, particularly, I talked about the school's early years. There's a marvelous video called The Place Out of Time. How to find it is in the chat. It focuses on the school's heyday in the 30s and 40s. Um, uh, there also, uh, it talks about some of the annual gatherings of alums and their families. Um, after the school closed, it was put to other uses. Um, uh, and one of the uses it was put to was a Correctional institution was there. There's a, the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice has promoted the idea that the campus be sort of reestablished and become a prison to school um, pipeline. Um, this uh, little sign that you see uh, in the picture, um, a couple of years ago, I was on a tour of Bordentown and there are signs on the main drag of all the um, important people and institutions that were in Bordentown, but there was nothing for the Bordentown Manual Training School. But uh, a bunch of people got to work and that has been corrected. So um, I am going to stop my screen share and um, is who's, who is running? Um, oh, I know, I really want to hear from Alice and I want to hear from Zoe and who's running the Q&A? Yeah, we're we're going to hear from Anne Kelterborn now. Hi, thank you for thanks for having me. Um, that was both the presentations were were um, phenomenal. Um, just to just to clarify, I'm in the Monmouth County Vocational School District, oh, and, and we we have um, we have the vocation the vocational program which. Um, is incredible. The building that I'm in, that I was in up until last year, was right next to our shared time program, where an, and people are, are allowed to uh, to visit. Well, not right now, but um, they have they have a full full restaurant with students um, students cook your cook the meals. They have greenhouses. Um, there's an auto mechanic shop. Um, we have all of we offer all of those. But I'm in the there's kind of two tracks within the vocational school district and I'm in the um, the learning academies that are focused mostly on the sciences um, and so I'm currently at communications high school which is focused on media um, we have a pretty um, 
great journalism program, TV and radio program. So my experience within a vocational program is a little bit different. Um, and it was really interesting hearing about um, this, the boarded, Borden Town School. Um, so I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to think about how to, how to follow, follow that up um, because we, like I said, we're, um, um, we're uh, the, it, it, it's, a, it's just, just hearing about the school, it was, it's just such a different experience than what I'm experiencing within my, within my own school district. But I did, um, the one point I did find really interesting was um, the discussion of that balance between the literary and the industrial pursuits. Um, and it made me think about some of my own kind of personal research that I'm doing, kind of inspired by um, this book by Goldie Muhammad called Cultivating Genius. Um, she studies the Black literary societies and um, and looks at the way that, and I think some of the, some of the um, comments that you're making, Connie, made me, I, I'm sure that there's, there's some links there, but just looking at the Black literary societies of the late 1800s and early 1900s, and looking at the various um, lessons and their practices, and what are the takeaways from those, and how can we infuse those within, within our schools, especially um, when literacy learning has been um, kind of put into just the English classroom and it's it's driven by um, trying to achieve um, standardized test results. And it was interesting to hear you because that's one of the things that she comments on is the idea of literacy learning being something that's across disciplines. Um, so that that was kind of the link that I was making as from an educator's view, um, point of view. But like I said, my experience is a little bit um, is a little bit different within the learning academies than within um, within a more traditional um, vocational program. Okay, um, thank you, thank you, Anne. Uh, Linda, were you going to say something? No, I was just going to say I think we're ready for the Q and A, and if everybody wants to uh, show themselves, that would be great. We love to see all your faces and unmute yourself. Uh, we have a couple questions in the Q and A. So before we go into the questions, um, I just wanted to make a quick announcement, everybody. You do know that we end at 8.30, but um, it, that means the formal presentation and so on. But we can stay on, a few of us, um, after 8.30 for those who just want to chat informally. But just so you know, our next program will be, it's always the last Wednesday of the month. So February 24th, we're still working out the, uh, the actual details of the program. So um, I can't give you a title just yet, but the March 31st program will be uh, featuring Rick Gefkin. And some of you know, he has a new book out, Stories of Slavery in New Jersey. So he's been doing programs in the area uh, the past uh, few weeks, including at T. Thomas Fortune the other day, but we're gonna have him here March 31st. And then April or May, we're not sure which yet, in honor of the year of the indigenous person from the United Nations 2021, we will be having uh, Claire Garland, who is a local historian and keeper of uh, traditions from uh, the native peoples in our area will be presenting. Um, and we'll have more details as we move along. Whoops, sorry. Um, the first um, um, question in the chat was from Jim Heaton. Do we want to just read the questions or let Jim um, address the speakers, Linda? Um, maybe Jim could just ask the question. If you want to unmute yourself, Jim. Yeah, sure. My question is, with the success of the yeah. <clears throat> you learned basically as Connie said at the beginning of the progressive period, um, uh, I'm, I'm wondering to what degree the White establishment, I would imagine, quite educational within just a manual training school and not expanding their social horizons with a more academic <laughs> education. Clearly, that would have been Dubois, Dubois pardon me, perspective, and uh, Booker T was pure trades, and that was probably just fine with the white establishment. Well, no. um, I'm, I'm, 
this uh, this happens to be my brother asking this question, and he and I can take this up um, in greater at greater length at another time. But um, one of the misperceptions about Hampton and Tuskegee is that they were primarily teacher training institutions, and uh, and and with that they sort of had a lot of in common with the normal industrial school in Ellendale. And one of the 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 students were engaged in manual work. Um, in part to help support the school. And uh, th that was how they paid their tuition. And also they acquired manual skills so that they could uh, go out and help the communities uh, that they were teaching in um, uh, be better farmers, be better carpenters, uh, 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 handle food better, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, there's sort of a misperception about it. I haven't really studied um, the social life uh, at Hampton or Tuskegee, so I cannot answer that question. My friend Lorraine here um, attended Hampton, but um, somewhat more recently than the time period <laughs> that, that we are talking about. So, um, uh, so that's uh, that's kind of an answer to your question. Um, I well, I sort of have the floor. I'm going to answer another question I saw in the chat was how unique was the Bordentown School, and um, it was in the north quite unique. Um, uh, I, there were um, established in the south during this period lots of schools that were doing manual and in manual training and industrial education. They were of widely varying quality um, uh, and uh, very few of them lasted very long. There were, um, there were very few that were boarding schools like, um, uh, like the Bordentown School was always a boarding school. I don't think there were ever any day students there. So uh, it was unique in the North. Um, but it was not so unique in the South. Walter, if you want to correct me on that, or um, I see Zoe is there and I would really love to hear, um, I would love to hear some comments from Zoe uh, because she is an academic and knows a lot about the school too, so. <laughs> Hi, Connie. Um, I would jump in on that question. And by the way, fantastic paper. Thank you so much for sharing your research with us. Um, I wanted to jump in on that question. Connie knows that I'm writing a book right now on the history of school integration in the North. And uh, the Bordentown School, uh, the manual training school features prominently in that, in that history. But I was really interested in the question of what are other similar schools like that in the North? And so I researched it. So I know the answer to that question. Oh, yeah. Better than I do, maybe. Good. Yeah, I, it's really hard to find. You have to look into individual records and individual districts in every single state. And that's a big project. Um, luckily, there is a lot of secondary literature as, as well that helps. Um, here's the shorter answer. There were a few separate all Black high schools with all Black faculty and staff in certain cities in the North during the same period. Uh, that would include the Dunbar High School in Dayton, Ohio. That would include the Crispus Attucks High School in Indianapolis and a number of schools, including elementary and high schools in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, also the Cheney School outside of Philadelphia was very similar to the Bordingtown School in a lot of ways. Uh, it was founded as a private school picked up by the state of Pennsylvania as an all black, uh, kind of like a, a high school, a secondary school and transitioned into a teacher's college. But at the time, normal schools were more like high schools than colleges. And so it was a teacher, teacher training school that got uh, pushed into the higher education system when teacher training became a bachelor's degree. And so Cheney College is still uh, in existence today as a public, historically black college in, this, in the state of uh, Pennsylvania. And that's pretty much it. So Bordentown was the only boarding school that was public and all black. It was very unique in that sense. Uh, and the way it was closed at the end uh, it, in response to the Brown versus Board of Education ruling was also unique. That didn't happen in any of those other schools. Oh, thank you so much. Um, yeah, Walter, I was just about to ask if you would comment also on what you posted in the chat, the article, 
And then um, Ann Goldman has something to say or ask after you. Okay, so I'll, I'll try and be quick because we had had the time running. Um, actually, it's a question for Zoe and then I can get to the point about the article. Um, over the years, I wanna say this is going back more than 20 years for me now. Um, I stumbled across little articles in African-American newspapers from the late 19th century, where Frederick Douglass was trying to fundraise to put together a school like Bordentown, but it was gonna be located in either Red Bank or Asbury Park. And I didn't know if you knew if any of those efforts eventually are what turned into what Bordentown became. I don't know, that's, that's a great question. I'm not familiar with Frederick Douglass doing that work. I followed his work as a school integrationist, um, which is covered in the literature, but it's not how Frederick Douglass is kind of popularly remembered. But Frederick Douglass fought adamantly for school integration, specifically in Rochester when he had his own daughter enrolled in the schools in the city of Rochester. Um, most Northern cities that had substantial black populations, which Walter knows uh, in the late 19th century had separate schools uh, for black students. And sometimes there were also black students in kind of the traditional or the white dominated schools and sometimes there weren't. So it varied state by state and city by city. Um, but I know Frederick Douglass was an adamant uh, integrationist. And then uh, he did also kind of value separate black schools. So a lot of the research I'm doing is trying to kind of disentangle those debates and um, forms of educational activism in black communities in the North over time is the kind of debates between using school integration as a, as a strategy to improve educational equality for African-Americans and using separate black controlled schools, black teachers, black administrators, um, and special pedagogy and curricula designed to, you know, to, to meet the needs of black students. So that's a good question. I'm going to look into it. Yeah, thanks, for giving, <laughs> thanks for giving it a minute. Yeah. Uh, on the other question that, that was posed, and I'll only take a moment for this. Um, the article I posed was about the idea of white philanthropy and the support for different African-American educators. And what I love about that particular article is that it completely shatters the Washington versus Du Bois approach. And so it really drills down into who were the people who campaigned and really shaped the philosophy of black education in the late 19th and early 20th century. And it goes back to a 2001 book. It's essentially a profile of Watkins' 2001 book. And so um, if you wanted to just get a taste of some of the other issues that are going on there beneath the surface, it, it's a quick way to get into it. Great. Anne, do you want to ask your question about the Rosenwald schools? Yeah. Yeah, so the Rosenwald schools were all in the South, but the question I have is, were they um, of the philosophy of, of looking for practical arts or, or were they, what was the purpose and the education available to the kids there to widen their options in life? Connie, you're muted. Connie. Okay, thank you. Maybe other people want to answer this question too, but I've been, um, I'm an enthusiast, I guess, for the Rosenwald schools. They were established, um, uh, Julius Rosenwald was um, the, not the founder of Sears Roebuck, uh, but he was sort of the Jeff Bezos of his day. He um, uh, had met uh, Booker T. Washington. Washington persuaded him uh, that uh, Tuskegee had, was doing okay, but what was really necessary were um, elementary schools in, um, in, in, in poor communities throughout the South. And so the Rosenwald Foundation would put up um, some of the money, the communities themselves would put up some of the money, the communities, if they wanted to build a Rosenwald school, they had to, it had to be part of, become part of the public school system, which was frequently a struggle. Um, the Rosenwald uh, uh, plan also included, they provided sort of architectural plans for some of these schools. The issue of the extent to which they were manual training versus um, uh, uh, academic work, I think that by the time the Rosenwald schools were opening that uh, uh, 
there was much more active learning going on in elementary schools and some of, so some of those issues were not as significant. Um, uh, there's, there are several books. There's a brand new book out about the Rosenwald schools by someone named Feiler Feeler. Um, and uh, I don't, can't say the name of it, but one of the things that's fascinating about the Rosenwald schools yeah. is- Oh, we know what, him. Oh, I well, didn't really um, I don't know whether it's Andrew Feeler or not. I'm sorry, I can't recall his name, but um, it was published by, um, oh, I can't re even remember, but at any rate, somewhere in Florida, maybe Atlanta University, University of Georgia Press. And mm -hmm. it is about Rosenwald schools um, and the number of uh, uh, people who are restoring them. There also is a tremendous video um, that is about the Rosenwald school. So, um, uh, that that's partially an answer to your question. Maybe Walter or anybody want to say something else? No, one of my great gifts of digital education is I can find things really quickly and type them into the chat. So <laughs> whenever I can find something that people can continue to use, I, it's better than me just talking. Okay, so are you putting up the Rosenwald book? Um, I'll find anyway. it. Okay, also. Um, uh, sort of another connected, one of the things that I found fascinating when studying the, um, the Bordentown School is uh, there have been a couple of books written about uh, black, pro black pro progressive black high schools in the South or progressive schools for black children and black students in the South. They were usually part of teacher training institutions and uh, they were, um, uh, they started uh, forming in the 1920s, 1930s and 1940s. There was a famous study of progressive white high schools. There was also a famous study of, um, uh, a not so famous study of the black uh, progressive schools. One of the things that I found fascinating and is that, uh, and I've talked to um, a couple of the writers of these books that, Apparently, the men who ran this secondary school study in the South did not know anything about the Bordentown School, which really mm -hmm. amazed me. Um, and I rather wonder how much of this was sort of intentional um, uh, ignorance. You know, the school had the terms manual training and industrial school in its names, and therefore it was a paternalistic, discriminatory, mm -hmm. oppressive institution. Um, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, also, Valentine never had any articles published in the Journal of Negro Education during these years, which also surprised me. Um, Walter or Zoe, I don't know whether either of you want to comment on that, but I, I found that rather fascinating. It's like the school fell into a memory hole for a while. Uh, this is Patty. Um, Connie, by the way, I don't know if you know, you have your camera off. Oh, uh, sorry. No, that's okay. There, um, now it's back on again. Now I see you. No, I have a question, um, actually, uh, I think for both you and Walter. Um, I, I'm fascinated at the whole history of the Bordentown School and everything that it represents. Um, but I'm wondering how those trends of um, perhaps uh, funneling certain groups of people into um, so-called manual training and limiting their academic education, which Bordentown did not do, but that's, um, I think there's some of, there may be some of that that's going on now, but how does, um, how do these things tie into current education, especially where we see, um, you know, school, uh, such a uh, disparity in uh, quality of education and uh, especially here in New Jersey, in towns that are largely minority seem to be really struggling and the affluent communities do well. And I'm, I guess it's because the education money is tied to taxes. There's a, it's very complicated. Is there any way to connect what you've been sharing, you and Walter with current events? Or is that in, in 20 minutes or uh, 20 words or less? <laughs> One of the things that really upset me when I was um, 
first began to learn about the Bordentown School is I was living in Trenton and sort of studying the school system there and um, half the kids dropped out of school before they graduated um, and uh, there were almost no vocational programs at the school and I found that really unfortunate. Um, one of the other things sort of in response to your question Patty is that even if um, uh, someone acquires a, a, a vocation in high school, it does not mean that that's sort of what you're doing um, uh, for the rest of your life. One of the guys that I knew in Trenton is actually doing a Zoom of his own tonight. He um, learned to be a roofer after he graduated from high school. And, but unfortunately he could make a lot more money selling drugs. So he spent um, a hunk of time uh, on what we called the inside. And um, uh, when he came out, he commented that he had he not learned to be a roofer before he went into prison, he would have had a great more difficult time um, making a living when he came out. Um, he now is has a rather successful real estate company in Trenton. Um, I was reading today about another, a far earlier graduate of the Bordentown School, like in 1910 or something. And he started off working in some candy business in Philadelphia and eventually went to dental school. So um, at any rate, just because you start off with a vocational education, it doesn't mean that you are stuck in that for, um, for the rest of your life. I'm thinking of that book called The Tyranny of Merit, which is out right now. Um, and I've heard of some other interesting programs on that. I think we are, we've gotten far too focused on college for all. And one thing I failed to mention, but it's kind of um, current events, the great granddaughter of um, uh, Reverend Walter Allen Rice, who founded this school, is Susan Rice, um, who is Biden's new domestic policy advisor. And um, Zoe shaking her head. I am hoping that um, some of her grand great grandfather's lessons will um, have some impact on, um, on her policy. I heard her talk yesterday about equity and um, I, there is there are serious equity issues here. So, um, <clears throat> Before questions before other comments that, what um, that was the question i think uh wanted me to jump in there i did want to give space for zoe too because I, I didn't know if you had stuff that you want to talk about contemporary ed oh me oh Zoe. no i i made my comment about trenton and that's all um uh i'll be quiet you talk <laughs> thanks connie and thanks walter um i wanted to actually go back i mean one of the questions this is raising in my mind in terms of how we understand contemporary education like the short answer to what are these patterns we see where large minority school districts seem to be struggling and wealthier white ones seem to be doing better is essentially that our public education system in america is seeped in racism it was constructed to discriminate on the basis of race that was deliberate from the beginning, not just against African Americans, but Native Americans, Asian Americans, Mexican Americans. And we have not effectively remedied those institutional structural inequalities. And until we like face those and address those, we're not gonna fix them. Um, inequalities in funding tend to go with it, but inequalities in vocational education, which is kind of the focus of today's talk, go with that racial aspect of education as well. So what I wanted to ask you, Connie, was how can you help us understand the vocational educational opportunities that were specifically available at the Bordentown School? Because my understanding is, first of all, they were divided by gender, which would make mm -hmm. sense for the time. Yeah. And second of all, they were restricted on a racial basis so that the school was kind of promoting limited vocational opportunities um, in a very kind of careful way. William Valentine in particular was walking a fine line and the context shifted around him over time. He was, he was principal of that school forever. Um, so the kind of context around him was changing as the world modernized and industrialized and the curriculum was slow to follow. So I thought maybe you could tell us a little bit more about 
the choices that were being made at that school and why they were being made and what the significance of the specific vocational programs were? Um, that's an interesting question that I don't really have a good answer for, except um, uh, that William Valentine was um, very, uh, was, was politically astute. And um, whether or not the curriculum changed much um, over time, I have not looked that much at or studied the curriculum all that much. Um, I do know that, uh, you know, I've, I've looked at who were the graduates, what did they wind up doing, uh, those who graduated around, who got out of the school around 1915, uh, 1930, whatever, um, those who came out of the school in the 1950s, um, there were far more um, professional, semi-professional people. Um, uh, one of the one of the very active programs in the school, in the starting in the 40s, was becoming a beautician. But um, one of the women who became a beautician uh, became a dean at Kane University. So um, <clears throat> you know there were. Uh, uh, I would say that by the 1950s that. Um, probably a, a tremendous number of the graduate number of the graduates went on for higher education and became teachers and social workers and government workers and uh, um, I one of the students who graduated in 1953 said what did he want to do I want to see the world and um, the thing that I found so refreshing about that is you know somebody from my high school would have said that and uh, uh, so the school did another important thing about the school um, that uh, uh, was uh, one of the, in the, this is from the video, one of the people interviewed and it said, um, you know, self-esteem, we didn't have any self-esteem problems here. Um, and another interesting comment that a graduate made is um, uh, that uh, when the faculty kicked our butts, it wasn't because we were black, because they kicked our butt because we needed to have our butts kicked. And I think that's another, um, that's another interesting lesson from the school. So I don't know whether that answers your question or not, but there was a significant change between the kinds of careers that people chose in 1910 and what they chose in 1950. So um, I think Walter, good, you look like you wanna yeah, say something. There's a good spot for me to jump in on, on the initial question about, um, vocational education today and kind of the differing context. Um, a lot of the stuff that I've written in the last, I wanna say five years has been on macroeconomic change, especially in the 20th century. And so when you're talking about 1910, pre-World pre War I, it's, it's still a majority agricultural nation. The kind of urban industrial growth that, that we take for granted for the middle of the 20th century, it has not happened. And so there's just a different idea of what even industrial education means in that mm -hmm. moment. And then as you see the great migration unfold, as people are moving to Chicago, moving to Los Angeles, San Francisco, Cincinnati, St. Louis, you're getting a very different sense of what's possible through these kinds of institutions. But the big answer I have for what we're facing today is what I talk about a lot in the, in the last chapter of my book, American Economy is consumerism that after mm -hmm. world war ii we have an enormous push that that goes on to the present moment to advertise products particularly the household appliances and um, things that make suburban living quote unquote more comfortable and um, luxurious that that construction of how people have a certain kind of lifestyle that radio and movies and television condition them to live are un incompatible with a lot of the 19th and early 20th century ideas about industrial education and vocational education even today, that we all like to drive cars. Very, very few people like to climb under the hood and lay on their back and change the oil themselves. And so we've got this kind of status that's built into our advertising and media culture that inherently stigmatizes the kinds of work we're talking about when it comes to lawn care is a huge issue in this region right now, that there's enormous money to be made in lawn care. But a lot of folks are like, no, I don't want to be associated with that, even if I do make double 
what I could make someplace else. They'd rather take a mortgage lending job, tracking down people who are late on, on their monthly payments, sitting in a cubicle and make a third of what they could make being a plumber. And so that's the kind of thing that I struggle with, with the way we pitch vocational education. And it's not really about the teachers or the principals or superintendents. It's just we occupy a culture where everybody likes to sit on a couch, use their phone to order from Amazon and watch the box show up on the step. But nobody really wants to be in the van doing all the work to kind of make that happen. And so those are the things that I struggle with is, you know, we, we need folks who do really important work when, as vocational um, staff or vocational work, vocational workers, and they're compensated well, but we've, we've stigmatized it in some really poisonous ways with our media. <clears throat> Does anyone Thank else? You so much. Well, it is after 830, um, which uh, normally we wrap up around now. Um, do you have any closing remarks, Connie or Walter? Um, well, um, one of the things that Walter talked about that I, I, I got a, got a, 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 a enjoyed is this idea of consumerism. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, one of the, you know, I'm writing about this school in North Dakota, which was established around the same time. And um, <laughs> One of the writers about this school talked about, I mean, quoting another, uh, uh, an economic historian um, whose name is uh, Coriano, but she wrote about producerism and uh, versus consumerism. And she was that at the time this school was established in the Dakotas, people were all producing something. And the idea was that we live off of what we produce. And uh, that kind of idea has, has disappeared uh, from us for a long time. Another thought that I had listening to Walter's comments is how unusual it is when we hire landscape person, plumber person, electrician person. I mean, whenever someone comes to our house, house to do some work like that, who is a black person, it's often a surprise. And there are structural and other reasons for that misfortune. But one of the really sad things I think is that there aren't landscape companies that, uh, you know, whoever runs them can hire their nephews, their daughters-in-law, their whatever, and pass some of these skills down. Maybe everybody doesn't have to stay in the landscaping business, but it's not a bad thing to get into or to work your way through college or to whatever, um, doing that kind of thing. And I, I, the thing that I think is really sad, um, and there are a whole lot of reasons for it, is that these kinds of service jobs um, there are very few black people who own companies that do them. And that, that means that young black men can't go work for somebody's brother-in-law or their uncle or something like that. And you know, I don't know what we can do about that, but I think it's a huge problem. So <laughs> comments? So for me, my last comments related to that too. Um, we have an enormous opportunity in the next three to six months to address a lot of these kinds of barriers through policy. And mm -hmm. so um, really staying in touch with your local congressman. I know a lot of folks in this area, you need to jump right on Vin Gopal and demand ways that the state is connecting to the way the federal government is to provide these kinds of opportunities. And I say, I don't say jump on with hostility. I'm saying this as to say, this is someone who's an ally. This is someone who can help us do something that hasn't been done before. And so whether it's him or Cory Booker or the governor who they're all up for reelection, well, Booker's not, but um, when these elected officials are all looking for their vote this year. And we have a very short window to get the legislation through Congress so that we, we can actually have some of the things that Connie's describing that actually promote these kinds of business ownership patterns. And I'll say, and I haven't said this anywhere else, there was an extraordinary corrupt effort locally in Colts Neck and Freehold Township at the minimum to siphon off tens of millions of dollars before the last administration left that went into all kinds of infrastructure investment 
in those two communities. And I think particularly about a multi-year effort to make it easier to get to the golf course in Colts Neck, that widened the road, that built out multiple lanes, that was all done to serve a very crass political end and cycle money back into folks who have no interest in the common or public good. And that's the kind of thing that's got to happen this year in the communities that need the most. And that's what I'm pushing for everybody to campaign for, particularly coming out of a call like this one. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. That's wonderful. There, uh, there, do you have any uh, Pat, comments to wrap up, Linda? Patty, there's one last question from Ann Goldman, and she's asking where the trades are un uh, unionized. Does this have anything to do with an equity of who gets training or apprenticeships? Absolutely. Black people were not welcome in unions. Um, it's as simple as that. Uh, it was very hard to get it was very hard to get that kind of training in the North as well as the South. Um, uh, after the Second World War, um, Walter, you can correct me if I'm not right on this, uh, unions did open up to uh, uh, Black workers, but not before that tremendous prejudice. Seniority is always a barrier to this day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think that we have answered all the questions. Um, thank you, Walter. Thank you, Connie. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you, everyone who yeah. attended and asked questions. Um, hopefully, we'll see you next month. Again, if you have any any suggestions of how to make this. Lorraine is saying goodbye, too. Goodbye. Oh, thank you, Lorraine. I'm so sorry. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for a great night and a great another great conversation.